Hey YouTube and hey Project B. It's Sean here, one of your project leaders, and I'm just going to talk to you about the flow splitter and also the control system today. Uh, if you came to the rig viewing this week, you would have seen this presentation, so this is just a recap. Now you can see that I'm wearing PPE, got glasses and lab coat, and just as a reminder that it's quite strict in terms of safety here. So when you do come in for testing and for demo day, you must be wearing long pants and closed shoes or you won't be allowed into the room. All right, so for the flow splitter, we've said that you can't have any reservoir type designs for your flow splitter. I've got a picture here of a reservoir design up here. You'll see it's got an in inlet, it's got a 2.5 litre pipe that goes to your system because 2.5 litres is the max three times dry weather flow and the overflow that takes all the rest of the flow off. Here I've got a graph of cold flow versus time. And this just shows you sort of the stormwater regime that we sort of might use. So it just fluctuates randomly. Here we expect to see anything over 2.5 litres, that's this area and this area, to be in your overflow tank because your system can't, uh, can't deal with that. If you use this sort of design, what happens is as the water fills up, you will get the correct volume coming out here. But when it reaches 2.5 litres, we expect to see something overflowing into your overflow tank. But this won't happen with this design because after 2.5 litres, it starts filling up this reservoir instead of going to the overflow tank straight away. So you'll have a huge delay before you see any sort of overflow come out at all. And in fact, what might happen is by the time the flow has gone under 2.5, your reservoir might not have even filled up yet and you won't get any overflow for the entire period. Because after 2.5 litres and it goes under, the reservoir will now start draining instead. And again, this won't be representative of the system at all. And you'll get the same problem when you come to a second peak, if there is a second or third peak, where you won't see any overflow or it might be a delayed overflow and you won't get good marks for it. So don't use an overflow type, so a reservoir type flow splitter. All right, so I've got a, another video, just a reminder, that's about the project rig. So if you want to look at the project rig, um, you can go to that other video. So we're talking here about the Simulink component. The student Simulink component is what you're going to be building in here. So you're going to be building a model rig, and you're also going to be building a control algorithm. In tutorial one, you were doing the model of the rig, so that's simulating the inputs, your incoming flows and incoming temperatures. In tutorial two, we looked at more of the modeling the rig, but we also looked at programming a feedback controller. Tutorial three, you'll do another one, and which is our feed forward controller for these control algorithms here. What happens is the model of the rig will produce some inputs to your control algorithm, and your control algorithm will produce some outputs, so you can model what's happening on the, app, on the actual rig without actually being here, because it's hard for you to always be in here to test stuff, and you do need to tune your controller to make sure it's working as intended. When it comes to actual testing and demo day, we'll get you to get rid of the model of the rig that you produce, and we just want your control algorithm, which will get you to upload to Blackboard and also bring on a USB just in case. At this point, we will detach your inputs and outputs, and we want you to use, give us some real outputs to, the, to our system, and you'll also get some real data from, say, temperature sensors and flow rates to your control algorithm, and see how that works. So the inputs and outputs that you'll get are over here. So if you have a look at over here, you've got your inputs, which are your temperature sensors. You've got two upfront temperature sensors, the hot and the cold, that you can use. And you've also got a mixed temperature sensor at the very end of the rig, which you can use as well. Now, as per the project brief, you can only use two of these temperature sensors for your design. It does mean you can do a feed forward and a feed back together if you want to, but we generally advise against it because the more control you put into that, the more complex your system becomes. And if it's too complex, there's a high chance of you failing because it doesn't work at all. It's better to have a system that sort of works than a system that completely fails entirely and just doesn't run. You'll also get the cold flow in liters per second. That's the flow ranging that we give you, so we know the flow will give you that. And you'll also have an input of a zero or one signal for a strain limit. In the output, you have a hot flow. You're controlling the hot pump and that's in liters per second as well, and that's the only output you'll be giving us. Okay. Talking about the strain limit, what will happen is you know the strain at 10 liters for your, when it reaches 10 liters in the batch tank for the tensile member you produce, you're going to give us that strain value. And what the, our control system will give you back in return is it'll give you a zero signal when the strain hasn't been reached, and it'll give you a one signal when the strain has been reached that you specified. When you receive that one signal, the cold flow will automatically turn off for you, and it's up to you to write some code to make sure that your hot pump then turns off to stop the water flow 
uh, because you've reached that strain limit. At that point there, you don't have to worry about any water left over in your system because we will automatically divert all water after that away from the batch tank so there's no extra water going to your batch tank. To do this sort of thing here, when we're converting the, your model inputs to your real inputs, you will be taking things that you've modeled, so your step, ramp and function blocks that you've been using so far, you'll be replacing them with this physical in block. So this in block um, takes a signal from an actual sensor and will give you that data. On the out end, instead of using the scopes to see what's coming out, you'll actually replace that with an out block, which again sends a signal out to our pumps to tell them what to do. So these two blocks are from the data acquisition package in Simulink. Now that package is available on all the UQ computers in James Forts and also the First Year Learning Centre. If you've got your own copy of Simulink, you might not have a license to access these sort of blocks. You can have a look in your Simulink browser, you might. There are different types of ins and outs, and you have to make sure you use the right type of in and out or you get the wrong type of signal. So up here I've got, for all five of these signals up here, these are analog input single sample signals, so you're going to use that type of block. And for the strain limit, this is going to be a digital input single sample. So make sure you use the right type for your Simulink when it comes to replacing those components. So that's it for now. If you've got any questions, again, post on Facebook, Casper, or just drop us an email via the help system. And good luck.